happens if we don't understand how minds work, and most of us don't understand how computers work, and certainly don't understand how these complicated artificial intelligence systems work, we can't distinguish between them. How will interacting with another mind, an alien kind of mind, affect our future, particularly since it will become a larger and larger part of everything we do, everything we depend upon? And what would the future look like if there's nothing like that, if it's doing something very different than what a mind does? And if we don't understand that, we won't be able to predict how it's going to affect us, how it's going to affect the society. Failure to understand that distinction or a belief that there is no distinction will have very different consequences. The dominant view in both neuroscience and artificial intelligence is that human minds and computers operate in fundamentally the same way. This belief, known as the computational metaphor, holds that the mind functions like a computer, processing information through algorithms and rules. But is this comparison accurate? The answer to that question is central to the future of both humanity and AI. Is there a difference between what computing does and what thinking does? Certainly when we look at the outputs of many of our most sophisticated computing machines, they look like they're thinking. They look like they're adapting to the world. They look like they're maybe even producing information or understanding information. One of the reasons that this is a problem is that we have always historically explained thought and experience in terms of our most sophisticated technology of the day. So in the 19th century, steam engines were kind of the model. And in fact, in Sigmund Freud talking about the psyche, he's talking about pressure, fluids flowing, libido. By the middle of the 20th century, it begins to shift towards telephones and maybe even radio, but basically communication networks. The dawn of the computer age changed all that. We began to think of these as machine minds, electronic brains. These were the most sophisticated technology that could do things that looked like what minds could do. It became the Ur metaphor for cognition beginning in the late 1960s. It's become harder and harder to divorce our ideas of thinking from what computing is. Well, in fact, there's many things that make them fundamentally different. One of them is that computing follows a step-by-step -step sequence, but the speed of that sequence doesn't matter. A computer moves from one state to the next according to fixed rules. It can run faster or slower without changing the logic of the operation. In thought, time is everything. Thinking is not a state. Having a thought is not a state. It's generating something. It's something dynamical. I like to compare it to a flame. We never say that a flame can be in a state. A flame is also a process. It's something happening. Thought is always something happening. In thinking about some of the most modern artificial intelligence systems, what we call large language models, things like ChatGPT, gives us a really clear window in how that is different than thought. In order to teach ChatGPT to do efficient language production, to produce a sentence that I can read and understand. It's grammatical and makes sense. It had to be trained on petabytes of data. That is billions and billions of conversations, of written documents, of explanations, of descriptions. That's how it's trained. It's trained to predict what would follow from a string of words. It takes billions of cycles of testing, of predicting and testing and changing, predicting and testing and changing. Huge amounts of energy are required for this and some of the largest computing systems in the world. And then they can produce sentences. A child of two has heard a few hundred, maybe by age three, a few thousands or tens of thousands of sentences, very simple. They're not the whole range of things spoken in English. They're not all kinds of descriptions. And yet, within a few months, they're producing English sentences and interpreting and understanding English sentences. They didn't have to learn petabytes of data. They didn't have to take in the structure of 
unbelievably billions of conversations and descriptions in order to just produce a sentence. One is this sort of brute force. You give the computer this vast amount of information and it takes billions of cycles and hundreds of thousands or millions of dimensions of statistics to figure out the relationships between the possible words so they can statistically get close to what a normal sentence is like. The child, in taking in a few hundred, has already developed this idea of what a sentence is, what a communication is, has figured out this form of communication that's symbolic, that is a bunch of sounds that are not linked to anything in the world in particular, and figured out how to use it to understand what somebody else is saying and to communicate what they want or need. Despite these clear differences between the way human minds and computing machines work, the computational metaphor remains the dominant model for human thought. Deakin believes the term itself, artificial intelligence, contributes to our confusion over the differences. I think the appropriate term and the more accurate term is actually simulated intelligence. And the reason for that is that a simulation is very clearly distinct from what it simulates. If I try to simulate the solar system and the movement of planets in the solar system, the simulation can predict, remember prediction is what this is all about, predict the position of a planet a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now. The simulation can be incredibly good at prediction, and yet the simulation contains no gravity, no mass, no distance in space, no velocity, no vacuum. The simulation simulates those things. It represents those things in a way that has none of the physicality. That's exactly what we've done with simulated intelligence. And therefore, it's not intelligence any more than the simulation of the orbits of a planet is artificial orbiting. Once we've made that distinction, we don't get confused easily about what's mind and what's machine. Understanding this distinction is crucial for making informed decisions in a world where minds and machines are co-evolving at an unprecedented pace, decisions that will shape the future of humankind. In a world that is increasingly run by artificial intelligence systems that are predicting our actions, predicting the way the stock market will change, predicting what people will want to buy or not, or predicting how to adjust people's political views. Knowing that difference is pretty important because one will impute agency to different sources. One is that, no, just that's how the algorithm works. It's, it's organized that way. The other is that it wants something. Does the computer want something? Does it want me to vote in a certain way? But it also means that we will, in a sense, not look to the source of that agency. So that if somebody is creating an artificial intelligence system that biases thinking in one way or causes people to buy things in a certain way, then in a sense, that's where the agency comes from. It's outside the machine. Somebody is to blame and we can actually put pressure on that, organize that. But if it's in the machine itself, nobody's to blame. So how we answer that question actually will influence how we affect the future of this, you might say symbiosis almost, between ourselves and this other way of generating knowledge. Another issue that influences how we answer that question is the role of embodiment as evolved organisms, we experience life firsthand. Our thoughts, emotions, and understanding are shaped by our bodies and senses. AI lacks this lived experience. How does this fundamental difference shape our understanding of agency and the nature of intelligence? Unlike the device, the machine, everything that I do, that my mind does, is about my being in the world is about my physicality, is about um, how I relate to things in the world, is about whether I'm hungry, whether I'm fearful. What it's about is not just the world, but it's about itself. What computing provides is no aboutness with respect to itself. 
the machine has nothing at risk. It's not acting, it's not, quote, computing to keep itself going because there's no self to keep going. But what if advanced machine intelligence eventually attains some sense of self and some version of consciousness? Something that has its own agency, its own sentience, and its own reason to keep itself going, irrespective of us, because it doesn't need us. Then we have a very different situation. That's where there can be, uh, like there is between any two people, a difference of opinion, a difference of need, and maybe what I need takes away something that you need. That's the science fiction negative model, the adversarial relationship. As we imagine scenarios for the future relationship between human intelligence and intelligent machines, whether we think of those machines as intelligent agents or simulations of intelligence matters. If in fact what we're talking about is simulation, then we have no adversary in the simulator. The agency is outside of it. The responsibility is not in the mechanism. The responsibility is somewhere else. The scenario that we would play out would be very different than one in which we believe that there's some level of agency. Whatever scenarios do play out in our future will be shaped by our understanding of the different ways human minds and computing machines work. How does each give rise to its own distinct form of intelligence? And how can we harness their complementary strengths to enrich both individual lives and the fabric of human society as a whole?